consult in them. Thank you. And environmental uh, planning projects. And Mervyn is joining us tonight uh, and he is participating at a distance. So thank you. And also I want to thank uh, Brad Guest for writing all these nice things for me. Thank you, Brad. And now the stage is alluring to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Okay. So thank you, Merlin, and thank all of you for attending this evening's event. I'm Lori Catalano, a faculty member in landscape architecture, and it is truly my honor to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Jana McKenzie. Jana's alumni of the program. Um, she received her BSLA magna cum laude in 1985. She's currently the principal and one of the owners of Logan Simpson, which is a multidisciplinary firm of approximately 100 professionals with offices in Fort Collins, Tempe, Tucson, Flagstaff, Salt Lake City, and Reno. We are fortunate that she has worked in Fort Collins since graduating. So she's been here her entire career. After graduation, she went to work for EDAW, a national firm that grew to be the largest planning and design firm in the world. Jana's passion for sustainability was ignited early in her career. In the 1980s, she designed the second um, ever Zurich Garden in Colorado at the time at the Fort Collins City Hall, which has endured throughout her career. She is one of five originators of the Sustainable Sites Initiative, which has become a nationally recognized design tool and rating system with the US Green Building Council. And one of, she was one of the first landscape architects in the nation to be a lead accredited professional. She has been elected and recognized as a fellow by the American Society of Landscape Architects for her project's contributions to the excellence in profession. During her 35 year career, Jana has led design teams to design more than 75 parks, open space, trails, public building sites, as well as streetscapes and alleys. Um, she's been involved and led design teams for projects such as the 2002 Olympics cross country biathlon venue, and also the iconic America the Beautiful Park in Colorado Springs. And more recently, the Sloan Canyon National Conservation Area in Henderson and an amphitheater um, renovation at the Colorado National Monument. She has also made great um, and significant improvements to our community right here. Some of these you may know, the Fossil Creek Reservoir Natural Area, Trimble and Tenney Court uh, downtown alleys, Museum of Discovery, Larimer County downtown offices, and the new city of Fort Collins Utility Administration Building, and many more trails and bike paths that she's been involved in. She continues to serve and promote the profession by employing student interns, serving as the state chair for the State Board of Landscape Architects, and speaking at conferences. Her greatest passions are mentoring others, many of them students, learning new things and spending time with family and friends. We are lucky to have her in our community as she is a friend and especially a supporter of the department and specifically the landscape architecture program. Please join me in welcoming Jana McKenzie. You got to turn yours off. When well, you get your, okay. Yep. All right. Test, test. Is this okay? I hear an echo. So this, I start swirling. It's pretty catchy. So we'll see how that is. So my goal tonight, thank you for having me. Um, there is a little bit of feedback here. I don't know if you guys are hear. Well, maybe there's a volume control I can go down a little bit on. Um, my purpose for the lecture today, and it's a great honor to be selected for this. I didn't do this to be honored, um, honestly. I do it because I love what I do. 
And I, my goal is to inspire others to go into the profession or at least understand the profession. So the first thing they ask them is not the plants. While we understand plants, that is this big of what we do. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how you can do this and how much power you have and the choice that you have in the profession. Okay. So I picked this kind of looking right with great power comes great responsibility, but it's true. You're responsible when you enter this profession. Maybe I just need to do page down instead of that. So it wasn't Spider-Man who actually coined that. Anybody read classics? Voltaire did. Voltaire was a great critic of the times and his life was so not in France. And so he is somebody who's dear, dear to my heart in terms of, you know, testing norms and to think outside the box. He was sickened by the abuse of power and other people who would take advantage of them, right? Through some of the religions that were going on at the time. So he was a real advocate for those who are underrepresented, so to speak. So to that end, I would like to acknowledge Colorado State University's Indigenous people acknowledgments that were standing here on lands that I'm not going to read it verbatim that were originally settled by very noble people who were not be stewards of the land. And the acknowledgment talks about how um, how important it is to acknowledge that and to continue education and inclusivity in terms of how we proceed in our lives. But Spider-Man did have to admit, there is a hero in all of us, right? What's heroism? Heroism is courage. Courage to stand up for what you believe in and for fulfilling a higher purpose, attaining a noble goal. It sounds like a sermon in here. You know what I'm talking about? But I do believe it's kind of like church here. Um, landscape architecture is very broad. I don't know if many of you knew this. And when I graduated, I was like, I'm not sure I knew it. I got in the profession and got exposed to so many wonderful master planning. He wants to think of it as that we design everything outside the building. We either do it or we're all, always in partnership with it. We either direct or we support it to the company and plan and make the world better. At all scales, from the from handwritten off front to a city to a region, you'll see some of the projects. It incorporates all sorts of aspects of science, geography, it's mind expanding. Civil engineering, you don't have to understand a lot of that. Botany, anybody knows what, know what environmental psychology is? People's relationship to the earth. Anthropology, economics, and the arts. It's not just a pretty drawing, but incorporating the arts. And it's a serious job. We are the stewards of the land, and there's a lot of changes that are going on. This particular picture is about the red background of this Estes Park a few years ago. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So what we do is serious, but don't take your job too seriously. You know, you gotta have fun. Surround yourself with people who like to do what you do and that you can commune with, because while there's a heavy burden that we carry, um, you have to have some fun during it as well. So people ask me, how did you become successful? I didn't know I was successful. I guess I am where I would be standing here. You know, um, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. It's not an end game. And I'm not done yet. So I love to help people to learn. It's a lifelong learning. So I haven't had success in all areas yet. So it's, it's a process. It's not an end goal. How did I end up as a landscape bucket? Good question. Like, here we are looking at stars. How do you do this? Anybody know this song? How did I get here? My God, what have I done? How will I work this? Where is that large automobile? Am I right? Am I wrong? So I don't know. Um, there were some, I, start, I did some soul searching. What were the pivotal events of our life? And I think a lot of things happen at about this time when I was about 10. Now you know exactly how old. 
And the first moon landing really connected me to things that were outside of myself and watching it and thinking that the world is a pretty big place, but it's not as big as the universe, right? And then two solar eclipses that came in. We watched that very, very energy. We went out and cooked the whole, yes, I was raised in the whole Since I was five, cooked the whole thing in the paper and bowl of that. And you can see it in this That Earth Day happened at the same time, the first Earth Day. All across the nation, millions of people showed up and there's a great environmental movement. And I'm still wondering if the time capsule is still under that tree there at Rittenberg Elementary. That was the time period. Because I can remember putting stuff in it. Well, while I was uh, at Rittenberg, people didn't want to be my problem. So I was a secretary in the Said, so, okay, so the new students, all the students here, you can't pick the mascot, but you can pick the mascot. So I was going to go after the mascot. Does anybody know why? This is important. What, why, what would be wrong with that? That's Arizona. And I was all about Colorado. There aren't any road runners here. So I wanted the native animal. And they said, well, you, you can pick, I think you can pick red and gold. Really, you're asking us to choose. And I was like, really? Come on. So I got disenfranchised. And then I learned that sometimes people in authority don't make wise choices. Like, who they see you? Buffaloes. They're bison. And this is an institute of higher learning. Sorry. I'm just, so let me get back to the point is that sometimes you can't get what you want. And, and I, so then I said, well, don't worry about things you can't control. They don't know what they're doing anyway. So I'm going to find something that I can control. Things that I can work with and try to get consensus around. Because clearly I was powerless then. So my first lesson is find a way to be effective. The next one has to do with developing a worldview. A few years later, my father went on sabbatical and took us to a beautiful place, Switzerland. And I learned a lot about how important it is to speak another language, what other cultures are, traveling all around the diversity. What Collins has been literally white most of the time I was growing up in. And so I can see people of color and people of different ethnicities showing up. It's awesome. I learned about city planning at that point, where you have clustered cities and you preserve open space in between, and how you have electrified vehicles and mopeds. And I also learned that the ski instructors were really cute. Had a lot of fun with that. But to develop a worldview, this was back in 1972, 73. They were already electric. They had electric trains. I come back and everybody has gas buzzers and go skiing behind school buses that ski, right? So all of that was very instrumental to me, I think, from a, a sustainability standpoint. Well, it's still a problem 50 years later. Okay, we're still dealing with the same thing. Be patient, it takes decades and people are in denial, but we are still producing at the highest level in the US. It was down a little this year, that year it was reduced. But compared to the rest of the world, we're still consuming per capita and putting out more carbon than anybody else. And transportation choices are an issue. Transportation and a lot of the energy. We're transitioning out of coal um, to a lot of the renewable energy sources. And the vehicle choices, I actually bought myself an electric vehicle four years ago. So my second advice is develop a worldview. Get outside your head, get up, understand it, read books, discover, experience, challenge norms, the things that you thought were right and wrong, challenge yourself. Learn from history, don't repeat bad stuff, learn the good stuff and build on it and definitely appreciate others. So how did I find CSU in the future? I started in four structures with the landscape design program last semester. 
but he taught me a class, and then I quit school because I was not been in three years. And I'm going, okay, I need to take a break. So I took a job as a breakfast waitress, serving up grit, fried cornmeal mush, and baking, having a good time, going to breakfast waitress, going as fast as you can. I learned a lot about that job, it's how you serve people. So I have jobs that we serve people. But then I took a career assessment, what color is your parachute? And it told me about landscape architecture. And lo and behold, Merlin showed up. Merlin said, the school with landscape architecture and I'd had enough weight tables. And so I said, okay. I would show you some of this really rudimentary work. Oh, by hand, we didn't have any stuff, right? We just drew on with markers and pens. And so he was gotten into visual simulation. Hi, Merlin. I don't know if you remember this one. This is Dixon Dam. And so I tried to figure out how to get rid of what was the dam scar over there, the dam scar. And you look at it, and so I decided to plant it. A little bit, I know you can't plant things on dams or the roots will penetrate and then the dam breaks. But that was beside the point. I just said, Okay, let's go to, you know, dirt and let's put things on it. So I learned a little there. I learned to illustrate. I had the most fun in an art class. I've never really drawn before. It was creative, it could make stuff, but I approached it like a science. So don't be scared. Try it. It's it's a science. This art is, is learning to draw, see the light, and you draw the dark. That's all it is. It's that simple. So to get a job, I showed up. Here I'm back in school, a couple more years into this. I'm getting pretty old at this point. Put my portfolio under my arm, my little handmade stripe thing, and put stuff in it and showed up and said, hey, I've got these drawings, I can do this. And they said, can you come tomorrow and we'll get <laughs> So sometimes just showing up is right. And that's how I got in the door. Um, Herb Shaw, you heard a little bit about this, is one of my mentors founded the office here in 1974, and I showed up in 1983, nine years later. That point, okay. Wonderful firm, started in San Francisco, and it had its, root, its roots in landscape architecture and environmental planning, and they did some of the most instrumental uh, work in the, in the country starting in 1939. Ekbo, Dean, Austin, and Williams. So, I never met in, uh, I met Ed Williams once, but I didn't meet the others. So he built an office here and it used to look like this. This is where the Bohemian Foundation building is, right next to Blue Co-op downtown. So it used to look like that and we renovated it, turned into a pretty courtyard. And I'll tell you more about that later. But my first project was that Sarah's Gate Garden image, which was really kind of fun. It was a summer student program that I was involved with. So I did a lot of different things, um, but I think the point is you also have to succeed. You have to learn the skills first. You have to learn the skill and be useful to somebody, right? You need to be able to help. So I learned how to do this type and draw my hand and circles and print and do all those kinds of things. Um, and But by doing that, I got to see some great minds of work and learn a lot about the profession. And the diversity of potential projects is really quite amazing. It's quite mind-blowing what you can get into. So just to give you an example of how the thinking goes is associating people with who have a lot of thinkers in what you're doing. It's what makes your career exciting in the long run. Herb Shaw had me calculating the carbon sequestration potential of trees on a planting plan in 1985. How many years ago was that? Yeah, and we're still talking about it. So, so what I did was trying, so one of the things had to do with um, trying to come up with a methodology. So my advice is to innovate. So I had to do research and figure out what that was and decided well, this isn't going to work because if trees start little, they get big. Do you want me to do it midlife and other things? So we, we came through that whole full circle and then I said, okay, I'm picking the mid-growth point and calling it good. But... So there's Herb, he has fun. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of the projects and what I've learned. 
This was uh, the American the Old Lands Plan. It was the first plan that established local land system in northern Colorado. So that's on the walls back there. Those are little hand overlay maps that you run through things together. Someday I'll show you all the technology. But um, I learned a lot about open space planning. And they hadn't started their open space program yet. Res reservoir resource management plans, things like Biocito Reservoir down in the Durango area and Navajo, where you learn how to balance recreation use with the natural resources that are there. Mentioned the Fossil Creek Reservoir, who did the management plan and then did, did the design of the facilities out there. Designated seasonal closures so that the habitat's protected. That's the first time that had ever been done in an open space area, to my knowledge. You've already heard some of the Fort Collins area park. I was known as Miss Park because I designed so many parks for the first 10 years of my career, which is really fun. You could learn a bunch. Um, you learn about detention ponds and sports fields and people and public meetings. One I wanted to show was Troutman Park. It was one of my first ones that I really dug in deep. So here I started in 85 full time, 86 deep into this project. And I would say that's basically my design. What I learned is that um, you can do things that people say you can't sometimes, like um, naturalize a swale through. We have two ponds, one's a four bay, one's an after bay, so you can clean it out, right? And that those pictures on the right are from, or those are recent photos. The structures are dated, they're 1980s. Things change. You think it's cool now? It's gonna be so has been in about 20 years. So get used to that, that's okay. But the structure of the park is still solid, right? It's functioning well. So things can be changed out from that. English Ranch Park's the same way. This is one here in town where the engineers wanted to have concrete drain paints for everything. And I told him why. Oh, it's easier to do it in the mall. And I said, let's do that. It was the first time we looked on the concrete drain pan and we made what was before anybody called it a mic sweat. So we naturalized it. Um, a lot of Loveland area parks have been involved with. We can, you might want to go and visit those sometimes. Happy to take people there for a site visit. But really got into a lot of sports parks, which was fun. Learned about turf. Then there's the Salt Lake Olympics, you said. This was one of those big projects where I won. And I said, don't be intimidated because I'm the only one standing in this room, but we're very different than Salt And um, trying to win projects. And they didn't, they selected us and I was the project manager on that. We didn't even have a principal there at that time because I wasn't a principal yet. So, but I think the point was, is I surrounded myself with a lot of people who knew what they could do. Local engineer, we have a person else, uh, Phil Hendricks, who knew a lot about trails and all that kind of stuff. So you put it together so that you're successful as a team. Cool graphics, cool bird's eye, that's a sketch. Um, over an aerial photo kind of thing, helping with the stuff. But I think the point here was it was a temporary event. It was really cool. Stuff happens, but then you don't want to leave behind something you can't use. So it's now a lot of that state for people to use and love. Did the Longmont downtown. Learned how to design a planter that's now in their standard brochure. You'll see that planter, that concrete planter. It was kind of fun. I also learned, don't do too many crude painting patterns. Do you want to hear about that? Concrete cracks and square roofs. And you'll see people trying to make things fit in a lot of curves. It's really difficult. Anyway, just remember that. Um, American Beautiful Park was really fun. That sculpture on the left is a, you know, it's water in the middle of it. And that was part of the design competition, artist design competition, that you can be part of to help select artists, which was really cool. But you can also be an artist by designing those obelisks, which are really cool. It was the first use of LED I've ever done. That was 20 years ago, 20 some years ago. And um, they're programming so you can play music in the lake. Pretty cool. Then they, a new principal. Some people call themselves principal as soon as they open a firm with their years experience. With Edo, it was a little more selective. 
So work with a loan or somebody can call you one of their partners, which then you own part of the firm, right? So I was pretty fond of my career, like 14, 18 years, something like that. And um, those three gentlemen were the other principals in the office, and that was our ride down into Atlanta to go have other people in the firm endorse me as principal. It was really instrumental in my life is to become part of the owner of the firm. We did the alleys. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. You guys heard about that before and after. It was really fun. If you hadn't seen that, Tenny Court was pretty dire, so was Trimble. And then um, I'm kind of bouncing around the years. But being able to manage an office, that was a new challenge for me. I had to manage an office of about, I think really about 60 people, 50, 60 people here down in Fort Collins. And that wasn't my greatest passion. I'm just going to be honest. I did it because I thought I could be good at it. And I did okay at that. But I was still doing projects at the same time. So it was kind of overwhelming. So be careful if you take on administrative tasks. But we did have a lot of fun. And then ACOP, which is a big international engineering firm, acquired EDA. And that pretty much was our demise. I'll tell, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that. But um, we lost our name and it became ACOP. We did things like the Liverpool Justice Center. You mentioned that, which is fun. You have to learn about uh, Sally Ports. You know, like hopefully none of you have ever been in those before. It's because when you put prisoners in so that they can't escape and have, you know, all, all the security stuff that's dealing with justice centers and police stations and stuff like that. But also a cool park out back where they now have a, a lot of music and stuff that goes on. Done interchanges. Has anybody stopped at that rest stop? They don't have to if you live here, right? If you're going down the highway, that's a prospect in I-25. That was a fun one. Um, and then we the State Highway 392 Windsor Interchange. That was a simulation that we did. And this is kind of how it's built today. So when you go to Denver, that was fun because it was all about and working with Kurt and the other design team members here on how to make it feel like it's a vernacular for this landscape without being literal. So it's got a lot of the sandstone. It's got... Uh, the little rubble rock and stuff like you see in the foothills. The landscape's suffering. They need to reduce, we need to reduce some stuff there. I was lucky enough to do work at military installations. I was the military installation master planner and designer for several years at Fort Greely, Alaska. One of two strategic missile defense bases. One's down in Vancouver in, in California, and then up here, that's the shoot, shoot out of Korean missiles. So I learned a lot about military base planning and places I don't want to go. I don't want to have that security clearance. I don't want that clearance. So what I my job was to try to make it a more humane place to live. Things like Fort Park and Bale for the Betty Ford Amphitheater and redoing that. That was really important to that community. One of the most highly contentious and debate, debate uh, more debates in Bale. And Aspen, you know, all these mountain communities and people have a lot of money. Um, they're, they want to get involved in a lot of stuff and have a lot of fun. But it was fun um, redoing a lot of that infrastructure on the upper bench there. The Mason Trail, that's cool, working with transportation engineers. We did design, preliminary design of all the stops and where they occur, but then we got to implement the final design on the trails. And trails are fun. This was a master plan project that actually went through design development in the city of Henderson, Nevada, UP Railroad Trail. It's about seven miles through 10. So you see, you don't just have to pick points. You can deal with um, indoor outdoor learning spaces. This was the Museum of Discovery. And we took, there used to be a trail that went through that had to be demolished. So we took it and stacked up that road and we to make our painting wall you see there. And tried to figure out how to get rid of those utility boxes in the front and we couldn't. So thank goodness they painted them. So then ACOM wanted us all to move to Denver and we said we don't want to because they wanted to sell the building we were in. And um, so, 
sorry. So there's three of us that started the Logan Simpson office. And then we still have four more that are with us. We took 11 to start with, and I think we have three and uh, seven left. Some people went on to do other things. I don't understand why this advancing. Clearly, I, I need to go faster. We had, to, we had to open a new office. That's a new challenge. And we're currently at, on Linden Street, yeah, right across from Blind Pig. Do you guys know where that is? Yeah, yeah. What else do you notice down there on Linden? You go up those little stairs and you go up a couple flights of stairs and we're up on the third level. Um, and then we overlook the fours. Does anybody know where that is? It's in the alley. Yeah. It's cool. Um, I want to talk about some other kinds of projects as well. So Rivers at Natural Area is in Loveland, and that was restoration of ponds and creating public use areas. Um, I kind of like that sign design, which was kind of fun too. A lot of things have happened in the last 10 years that I would say is some of the most instrumental work and the most significant things that, we, that I've been involved with. And, and uh, it had to do with the 2013 flood, right? This is the 10 year anniversary of that that just happened. And it happened in 1976. And one of my partners and mentors, Tom Keith, worked on the 1976 flood recovery. And this happened again. It's all, yeah, a lot of things wiped out, took months to rebuild. And it was a huge restoration master plan. We were a sub consultant to an engineering firm who was coming up with the designs that they're going to implement for US 34 through this canyon and how to deal with the river restoration at the same time. So we worked with them to illustrate a lot of the ideas of how something could be restored so that the public could understand it and that the, because the lay people don't understand this stuff. So you have to be able to communicate engineering concepts into palatable drawings, right? With cross sections and um, before and after riprap. How was riprap buried and how does it work, right? Um, we put together a website. We might be website design. This had to do with all the people who would drop pins on this thing and then put a palm. It was 10 years ago. It's got a lot of years. But this is one of the first ones I've ever been involved with, where they said, I like this, this is happening. And so this was a public involvement tool so that people could comment and say, what needs to happen? So I thought that was pretty cool. We've done down, John's, downtowns, the Johnstown down here. Everybody was against this. I still hear people complain. Everybody hates narrow streets, right? But they had no sidewalks. They had no place to hang out. I said, okay, something's got to give. So instead of being diagonal parking, we put parallel parking. Yes, they lost a few spaces, but they figured out how to put parking behind the buildings. So right now it's pretty successful downtown. We've done it in Fruta, master plans on how to deal with their downtown and then subsequently design a few blocks through Fruta. Came up with the master plan for the Lincoln Corridor. Hey, there's another iconic Odell. Does anybody know where Odell is? <laughs> yeah. Everything we do here is about bikes and beers, right? Um, that was pretty cool because you had to learn about different transportation and, and street cross sections that would move traffic, but also bicycles and people all at the same time and come up with a way to solve all those issues and deliveries into the businesses. Mahaffey Park in Melbourne is really kind of a fun one. That one was based on the history of the Overland Trail that went through this area, which was fun. So we took a lot of cues on the design of that and um, the compass there on the lower right, again, that's working with an artist, is, is sort of an abstraction of how the pioneers found their way across the plains to end up in Loveland, which was known as the cherry capital. Cherries didn't live very long because they all froze, but we still did plant an orchard there in an attempt to try to make uh, reintroduce some trees because we wanted urban agriculture. Um, it has a detention pond, there's the orchard, this one was really fun. Let's see what we got here. I think I'm doing the right. This team, Smith Mountain Park. You guys ever drive up to Estes? Right, it's on the way. And it was totally destroyed with the 2013 flood. So this is how it went before. I'll tell you the quick story. 
can, does my cursor work on this? Can you see that on these slides? You can't, can you? That's all right. Um, so over where those rubble piles are was a power plant. And originally in the 1920s, they built a power hydroelectric plant right there. And the river originally kind of bent before the, the 2013 flood. It went like that, kind of like that, but it was really minor channel. And then they put a building right in the way of where the velocity really wants to go down the river. Well, in the 1976 flood, that got right. So they moved the power plant a little closer to the hill. There was a little foundation. Well, and then they put the river back in the old position, and there was still a park, and they built it as a park that was very urban in character. It had all these ornamentals and bluegrass and everything else. So nature has a way of fixing it. So at the 2013 flood, wiped out that other power plant, and it sent the river right over to the edge of 34 there. It also wiped out some of the civilian conservation pool historic structures, which are really cool up there, unfortunately. Um, so, and it was a huge flood. There's many things. So what we did was uh, take it, so you can see what happened at, in the sea dot in their infinite wisdom to put the river again back to where it was, where it didn't want to be. So our process was saying, let's follow the forces of nature now. And so you can see before and after the channel that came back through. There's a tree right in the middle of all those pictures that's your reference point. So we we filled in the whole channel and made it go around the edge as where it wants to flow around the bend instead of taking a hard left. Where does it want to take hard lefts? Perfect. Well, so it turned out really well. Um, we wanted to tell the story of water, which they ended up not blasting into the rocks, but you know, this is all part of the innovation. You tell the story something meaningful. What's the power of water? How much does uh does the water generate in terms of energy? How many light bulbs would it power? So and this is the way it looks now. It's not bluegrass, it's all native, natural. There's a lot of engineering in this river. There's what's called lateral trains that go across that fix the channel so that it can't move anymore. And I mean, you can't is the most term. Big enough flood. But, um, and then we made this fishing platform over there. And so most people build platforms that are like decks. How satisfying is that to sit there and dangle your foot off the edge? Fish and water is not good. The water is going too fast. You can't catch a fish. So, in the highest, higher flood waters every two years, when the flood comes over that platform, the river goes over. You can't be fishing in the region. The water is raging. So, when it goes down, people can get back down to the other river. So, we had to engineer it so that the velocity doesn't wipe that out. There's concrete, big rocks. You can't see them. And then interpretive signs in natural landscape that turned out to be So I'm very proud of this one. We won an honor award from Colorado Chapter Day of Soleil a couple years ago for that. And then an artist came in and built this kind of cool contemplative sculpture as a memorial to, um, and it looks like bubbles. I don't know. What do you think? Kind of bubbles, water. I like it. So they had memorials all over this park before, like on benches and little glass. They're all in that, you know, they, they got it, it, it removed, I don't know how many hundred thousand cubic yards of material out of this and everything else went. So yeah, this was a better solution is to sort of make it more, um, instead of benches with plastic. The Fort Collins Utilities admin building, Steve, see where works with me, he does amazing um, visual simulations. One of the four rooms, that little building that says cafe on it was part of the big brother's picture, and I've never known in there. We didn't have to And it used to be in a little different area in the site, but we figured out where to replace it in the same orientation, put the footprint on the site of where it used to be and move it over. Now it's like a cool cafe. It's, it's, I think it turned out really nice, as well as having, it's a lead platinum, it was the highest lead platinum in the country at the time. So Fort Collins does a really great job 
of being a leader in sustainability. So this was a good exercise. What we learned didn't work was the green wall. In fact, we'll about that story. Start here around the chain and that's one. And we really wanted to do a green wall and it just couldn't be maintained and people couldn't do it. So it, that failed, but it was back there by the enclosures, so utility enclosures. Uh, heritage gardens, that was fun. Working uh, with all the people in the horticulture department to figure out what that should be like. And the center of it, I'm a little worried about it because I drove back to the end of the day and decided to get distracted by the end of the Wasn't about structure designs, anybody know? So you don't think it wasn't a failure at first sight? No, you're okay. We're good. <laughs> Didn't know that, but it was it was kind of fun, you know, working trying to make that work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a different scale. So I would say a lot of these things have been sort of site design, very tangible. We do system-wide planning. We did the state of New Mexico score, the state comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. It is a requirement of all states to update that so they can get land and water conservation costs from federal government. So we did it in New Mexico a few years ago. Um, and that was kind of interesting. We're in high level costs. The state on where to invest and what's important from a statewide perspective. And then I've probably done 40 parts of our reading that. Well, it's how do you deal with the public on what they need from their reading infrastructure in a community where the bus go, where the channels go, the bus go. How do you have traditional bus places now that you deal with that creation? Recreation centers, recreation programs. We have subs, we have subdisciplines, we have also the recreation programs. So, so they need to be updated about every 10 years. But it's, it's how you city council or county, like I told you, the open lands plan, that's how they budget their money. That's how they ask people to cap themselves for service tax. That says, come in and you want to use the sun, you want to work. And on this trail system. So that's how you get the community involved to rapidly around the community for some of those symbols from an activist perspective and some of the recreation as well. So some of the innovation that I think is probably something that I have a lot to do with it's not even standard practice in the industry. Some of it has to be able to establish our levels. We like to compare ourselves against other communities. Two acres to the thousand of the neighborhood park. Two acres to the neighborhood park of the thousand. Or four acres to the thousand of the community parks. I just throw them out, but they're different for a community. National Recreation Park Association wanted to normalize it across the country, and I said, there's absolutely no way that's going to make sense. So we started working on all the service ways to analyze that specific to each community and what they could afford, what they could do, what they want to put into their parks. And it's going to be different if you're in Manhattan in a very dense urban environment than if you're in a suburban community. The other thing has to do with the walking distance. Everybody who draws the service, and that's how you can draw service. And that's just how you can walk or walk over the house to the next community. So we started to use the IR to be We figure out how people can walk. So the bubble looks quite different. There were a lot less people who could get to this park. And so we started analyzing that. So that was part of the innovation. And then we get into the specific pro uh, project organization. Which can be immediate. This is one for people that have done several plans for them over the years. But they wanted to get people excited about renovating the parks. So we came up with some conceptual plans because they want to go for a mission and go for it and then be able to go for it. And, 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 and um, so they have some of the parts and these three visualizations of it. So that they can allow the people to start to move these projects and get people excited about them. 
or in um, Delta, Colorado, tiny little Delta, poor community, wonderful potential, um, coming up with examples of how they could do a Riverside access point. So having worked on rivers enough, I knew kind of how to design this without even being an engineer, right? And then show them how you can do that. I don't know if they've found the money yet or not, but we just did it in McCall, Idaho. So just did the whole world. Anybody want to call us? Beautiful little place on the Bay of Lake, very tourist oriented. This was where we got work. It's the gem, small community, but we got to do that in the office. That was all part of the policy planning that we do. It's going to be really such. We do capital cost estimating. So you have to figure out what's going on in these projects and how much to budget for them. What are the components that you're going to be able to do? What are the components that you're going to be able to do? You can package. That might or might not be affordable. And then you have to prioritize and say, what, what are you going to do first? So you work with the community to figure that out. There you go. Isn't that exciting? Those are the cost estimates. We deal with those a lot. The last thing you did, uh, the, the amount of time you actually spend drawing pretty pictures on a plan is pretty small. Just going to tell you. The rest is figuring the stuff out, which is so exciting. It's how to make good decisions. That's what landscape architects do. Here, property tax spreadsheet. City of Steamboat Springs, I had to relate how much property tax they might get for certain tax levels, actually. That was Steamboat's analysis. Okay, so yeah, we have to use our net frame. You don't like that. You don't need to do it. Yeah, this is the most important part of the But for me, the most exciting part about it was that I'm just not done learning yet because there's so much. We put together graphics and have to organize people. Dental parks have never organized themselves. It sounds crazy, right? I mean, they're, they're changing. They have a lot of things going on in the parks. It's just so to have to work through a two and a half year process to explain their park system support as an ongoing tool to people. Number one, it's like how old is our system about what to tell us about what this place. So we ran the whole process to try to get all these different divisions in the parks and rec and design community groups together to try to figure out how they're going to do business. And it deals with their construction standards and everything at the end. So we had to patch it all in a document. But it was fun making little cool graphics. And the infographics, so you look over, over them, and then you pop on it, and then it goes to a different page. Quite intense from a PDF standpoint, I will say. But yeah, so that's the table of contents. It looks like that. So you click on the floor and it jumps you to chapter four and then you get something else and it jumps you somewhere else. One of the most things I'm most excited about lately comes back to us the importance of inclusion and I love this graph. I have to say, we kind of stole, stole it from a concept that I had seen and then we made it so that the graph would help because we did like this system. Imagine tomorrow, parks, parks, and recreation for all. So it had to do with equity and inclusion. We came up with a new model on how we can serve the most disadvantaged communities, historically under underrepresented communities. Through the model that you put in GIS, including where they haven't had investments in the past. Where has a city not invested in the past? So yes, we use a lot of GIS for analysis tool. And then we change it to some other way of well, because GIS isn't necessarily for the same cost. I'm just gonna say. Um, this one is the GIS product. And if you know Denver area at all, to the lower left is where that very big park is and all the open space is, that's where all the airplane people are. And then the upper right is the last group. This is where the lower income, transit dependent, health deficient in some areas, other things that are going on. So that they've, they've chosen to now invest more money into those areas to try to get people access to parks, parks and recreation. So I'm very happy about that. Fairfax Park was kind of an exercise in that as well. Fairfax Park is right in Park Hill neighborhood. 
right at the edge of the old ethnically diverse neighborhoods and the very rich that we have on south. And so um, we had this great process and everybody showed up. It was really fun. And I think at the end of the day, people were really happy. We had people designing things with the boots and the boots and the model. But what I wanted to do, and it hasn't happened yet, was with UCD because they're there, is to do the research on um, does the user profile match the demographics of the neighborhood? So where we're getting as a profession is measurements and metrics. You have to prove performance of a project, right? To be able to justify the amount of money. Well, you don't have to, but really it would be nice to know what all the things are going to be together. Wouldn't it be nice to know that the people who show up in this park are actually going to be designed it for? And if not, what do you learn from that? Was there something here that people aren't feeling comfortable for safe in the space? So it's a way for us to learn. So here's a lot of times and how to We need university partners to deliver on that because the private sector does not have the money to put into that. All the monitors. So all these voluntary research projects or other things. I have a ton of ideas of projects. This is how it looks now. It's all built. So wonderful little. Oh, there's like a little hamster cage over there. So play with it. It's because it's really space limited. We went vertical in here. Anyway, we'll see how it turns out over time. One of the last ones I want to talk about. Um, St. Charles Mason Park. This one is in an impoverished neighborhood that's near, do you know where the film is? Well, it's all three. But the film that lived here came in the late 1800s, mid to, mid to late 1800s. And they're in Mexico, it's not much in Squawla. They had moved from Mexico and they moved here. And uh, there's a whole history here. But they were, they, a lot of them came for Africa and they came to work to work in the snow. Well, as a result of the snow, they have to become new lands that right now there's some environmental justice stuff. Yeah. Um, so I feel like, you know, this is like my project and I got to give some, give them something else. They have had not had in this area for a long time. And they have some pretty dense neighborhoods and then they have all these agricultural properties out there everywhere and everybody says we don't need a park they don't even want a dog park they don't think they want a dog park but a few people there do i think i lost that battle in any case so this is cool it wasn't that picture in the upper right is where they even get water so if you open them we go a little well they would take their buckets down there this neighborhood didn't have running water or sewer until 1985 they used, well, they had some running water, but they had outbound houses. So, you know, there's a whole history here. So I'm really happy to be able to come up with a park design we're working on. I'm not going to go into detail on it. We're coming up with the final master plan right now. Katie, you're going to be drawing that pretty soon. Um, historic and interpretive sites, which is really fun. Um, we can tell the story. Now, what, a lot of people are bored by history. <laughs> What's the purpose of history? Yeah, but well, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? The best part of history is how it relates to today. So when people talk about the interpretation, it's not a good one to get on. It's a good one to get on. So we can do today and understand how history that's done. That makes sense? It really does. It's not a good one to stick. It's about a lesson that you learn. So we have many different kind of historic sites that we're working on. One with Nathan Weaver's house, and really, which would be a fascinating story if you know about the Indian history. Any case, so um, Saddle Burning Amphitheater, the theater, I was there in 1966 when it was built, when I was a little tiny kid. And now it's historic, and so am I. <laughs> and, and I have a poster of going in front of Baby Lee's benches and things that were built when I called his dad out and my little six year old tissue there. Uh, and now they're all, and we have to run and eat all that stuff. It's cool design. Uh, a visitor contact station in Sloan Canyon, which is about ancient petroglyphs from indigenous people. So you can go walk out into the and see amazing petroglyphs. 
We do a lot of reservoirs, more reservoirs. Chimney Hollow is going to be built pretty soon. This is a new, and then on the right is the is a Wolf Creek that's proposed. I'm not a big fan, I'm just going to say, of reservoirs, especially ones that are power pumped forever instead of gravity fed. To me, that's that's sort of a. But there's, uh, I can talk about that philosophy later. And there's, it's kind of like building highways. You're never going to build them big enough. Just going to say, if we just turned off all the bluegrass lawns in Colorado, we probably wouldn't have to build new reservoirs. And I just did that in my backyard, took half of it out of this winter. So, been too long. So, we have to reach the community, learn all the tools to uh, talk to people and to reach them. Maybe people don't have the meetings. Just like, who really wants to come to a lecture? It's not fun. Really, I mean, so, so you want to be zoomed. If you want to, if you want to go drink beer and shop, you need to get there. Or you can do it at a festival. You do it during a normal thing. So we have a whole toolkit of things we do now. Try to get comfortable talking in front of people. It's hard. The hardest thing I did in college, or in high school, was a speech class, and they told me not to talk about the class. Wow, that's something you know. We should talk to you earlier, because you're making a case, right? Same kind of lawyer, you're making a case. Build your case, and then tell your story. So that's how you're going to present, well. And practice the eight R's. People think it's also it's just recycle, recycle, recycle. No, that's the last thing you do. What's the first thing you do? You refuse it. Don't take it in the first place. Reduce it. Use less if you do take it. You use it. If you can't do it, repair it, you gift it, recover it, then recycle. So please keep that in your mind. I would hope that nobody's drinking out of single purchase water bottles anymore. Oh, Lori's got one. Gotcha. This was my promise 12 years ago. I bought one of these and I haven't, I bought one of those in, in that time frame because of that single screw stuff. So, and I kept losing them in airports and I was telling Lori that I see all the things on each other and we didn't even have a but when I lose all my stickers whenever I lose my bottles. So stay curious, okay? That's what this is all about. You'll never know it all. There was an article I just read in Guardian. It's a Guardian in the US. It's an online publication, which is quite provocative and insightful. It covers things that other media things do not. And it was about an Irish student who had, had a high school teacher who told me about their quest and what was so interesting about them was it was like going into a concrete or into a cave. Uh, and you put off the mines in them and you go into the cave and you see the front. And then you come in this car and then you see the front. And then you go through the river and it's bigger. And you know what? This is all world. And it's the bright spot in there, and you know that she was seeing the people who were out of the history engaged in the So, the world is your oyster. Do go for it and do it. That's all I'm going to say. How do I stop sharing? And I think I need to come over to my Zoom meeting. Hmm. How about uh, any questions? What do you, I, do I have? You're done. Okay. Oh, yeah, you got out of Zoom, so you cut off online. Do I need to go back in for questions? Why don't you yeah. take questions and we'll handle the technology? Okay, why don't you do that? Anybody? Anybody left? 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 An
I didn't want to be better than people. If you just stand right here, they can see your face. Oh, if I stand here, can I see Merlin too? He's he's got his screen off. He got his screen off. Okay. A uh, bonkers project. Oh my goodness. It just depends on how you want to find that. Uh, Probably one of the most complicated, at least early in my career. I don't, bonkers is kind of a hard one to define. Very challenging was that America, the beautiful part, because we came up with an idea for the whole district. They wanted to do a site. I said, you can't design the site without looking at its context. So we came up with a structure plan that had to do with putting a bridge over, which is now the Olympic Museum bridge over to that park. But the idea that there needed to be a connection from downtown that then, and we also said that you don't have enough park space, so we curved a road. So, you know, so that part, I learned so much about that because I learned from engineers about the scour potential of rivers. So, the bottom of the river, the mining building, the learning all that stuff is pretty amazing. And the bottom of the And it was at the artist. And it's, I didn't know, you know, it's not very expensive project. And so, all the things are. But that was the most obvious thing that we can do. No, that was interesting because I've never been in the military. Some of my military families, and I had no idea that there was. And I really had just sort of poo pooed the idea of strategic missile defense. Oh, yeah, right. Well, there's like different levels of aids there. So I showed up. Myself and I started just walking around, and pretty soon all these vehicles come after me, and they've got their big guns. And I'm going, hi, and I'm taking pictures. <laughs> and I knew I was going please just ask him. Oh, geez. he said, okay, I just got up, okay, but boy, was that scary. <laughs> Zoom in with their guns. And, I don't, there's many stories. Oh, one story is that with English French Park, I think it's a public process. And it's where they were. Where were the public? thought this was just great. A real not like the restaurant. She invited the manager, came over to her house, and we had a private meeting with them. This was my favorite story all over again. Um, it was above my pay grade. I went in there and they told me to change it because she didn't like it. And I said, we've been through a public process. He says, it doesn't matter. The public won't care. And that was the city manager. That was the ultimate boss. I could not change that. The park's fine the way it is now. I just felt just totally used. You know, we've gone through this legitimate process. So that was longer, and that does happen, which is very frustrating. Then you have to be humble, and I was like, yes, sir. Okay, we know who's the ability. 
So, other questions? Thank goodness for the internet right now. Number one, because I learned a lot about Salt Creek through the internet and learned enough that I could then have an intelligent conversation with the people who live there, what I thought might be some of their issues. Otherwise, you ask the people what is important to you. It's their park, it's their culture. Um, involve the indigenous communities, which is a whole nother uh, question on how to best do that because they are separate nations. They are separate nations, you know, how they operate. And so there's a whole protocol and from the federal government standpoint to do that. But um, yeah, you do a lot of research come up with an idea with because with, uh, I grew up around here. I knew trails. And so with Mahaffey Park, I thought, well, yeah, the trails got to go through here somewhere. So we tried to figure it out and they actually found some old remnants, but it'd been plowed over. So it's, you know, it's just sort of a paying homage to the overrun trails there, but without being too little. Yeah, I hate being too literal about some of the stuff because you can look that up on the read. So my, my idea is to make it intriguing, make it more intriguing so people ask questions. If they don't get it, they do. Don't hit somebody over the head with it. Please just, in my opinion, unless it's a visitor center, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to do that. We need a National Historic Trails landscape designed for the site in Casper. And they had never told the Native American story yet up there. It was all about the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, all of the people that were coming up, you know, the, the dominating culture. And so our thought there was let's find similarities between these people. You're moving across the prairie, so what will be using? They're using wheeled vehicles and actually Mormon hand carts with drag and stuff, you know, doing other things, but they use triboys and they use dogs. Uh, to haul a lot of their things. So so what are the commonalities? So I think it's the opportunity is to build those bridges. So if people aren't scared of different cultures, we all have pretty much the same wiring, you know, want the same things in mind. So you try to figure out what those commonalities are. And to not sanitize history. I, I have a shirt that says read band books. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Because if you can't get over what happened, it happened. So, okay, get on. Doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean I'm bad. It means let's move forward in a positive way to make everybody feel like they belong. It's not about the past, it's about the future. Moving on to that, what is, what do you think has been the most impactful historic design? Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't done a ton of those historic designs. Impactful. I'm hoping to do one that could be really cool. But we're working on this because um, Nathan Meeker was an early settler of Greeley and, and the Greeley Union Colony. And so he has a whole history there. And there's a site there that's where the Meeker Museum is. And it's this traditional Victorian house with a blue dress on and stuff there right downtown. It's a lovely little site. But Thank goodness to the museum director there. If you look at their page, Greeley Museums, what they say is pretty cool. He wanted to know if there's a way to tell the other story of the Meeker family. And the Meeker family, their, what their bigger story was, well, they did settle in this area, which impacted indigenous cultures clearly. But the big event was the Meeker event, which is over in Meeker, right? Off the White River in, on the West Slope. And that's where he was, he became, after he moved from Greeley, he went over there and he became the land, Indian agent what they called them, who were telling those Native Americans they couldn't live the way they did anymore. They couldn't graze their horses here. They couldn't do that. They couldn't do this. This was in the 1860s, right? And so they got so fed up with it, they came and they murdered Meeker. They, were, they had enough. He was, he was taking away their ability to hunt game, to, to make a living. They were starving, so they murdered. Nathan Meeker, and then they took his wife and kids and they took them over into Utah into the reservation. They, she befriended the, the Indians there and they, they, she became the advocate for the indigenous people going forward. It was kind of, it's a fascinating story. The wife and the daughter. 
So, you know, I, I would, but I, but without, that's just all, that's just the story. That doesn't have any indigenous people's into it, right? That need to see what story they want to tell. What does this tribe want to say about that? So hopefully that will come to fruition in the next years if somebody uh, comes up with funding to be able to go forward with that project, which would be cool. And they may say, no, I don't want anything to do with it. This isn't the right place to tell that story, which may be perfectly true. So that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, one story is that I picked the wrong color benches at Rossboro Park in town. Oh, they were awful. Awful. The story number one is do not pick colors of sitting inside. Go outside. Everything lightens. They turned this pasty green. It was awful. I would definitely do that over again with different color. Um, yeah, they're pasty, awful bleh, green. Um, other things you learned, like long, the, the concrete, it was a cool pattern, but it breaks. It doesn't crack the way it needs to, so it needs to be redone in a little different way. But it served its purpose, but the time was pretty cool. Um, I think it's still there. It might still be okay. Um, there's all sorts of little lessons you learn just about every project. Yeah. That, oh, never do a planting design without having the person who's going to maintain it be there, or a site design. Because even though you think, oh, yeah, you should be able to maintain it, if they can't, it's going to fail. I, that happens over and again, actually. And that then it looks like crap later. You know, you go in there and say, what happened? Well, they couldn't maintain it. So you have to understand that as part of the design. Yes. Sorry, I'm looking this way. I need to stand over here. Both, both of those, because a lot of communities have their public um, PAIOs, whatever, you know, uh, the public engagement, or the face of the community, and then they have some other small communities that have no idea. You know, so I, when I was doing the Joe Roll Park down in Delta, a community of 750 people, you know, they, I just showed up at the River Fest and had everybody come and did an online questionnaire and do what you can. So you, you just kind of learn what the tools are and they're adapting really quickly. Menti polls, other things during your public meetings, all this other stuff you can do. So, so no, I was really dumb when I got out of school. I mean, I just knew the skills, right? It's a long process. It really is, so don't beat yourself up if you don't get it right and stuff. And don't forget to ask other people other than on what we're supposed to do, what I'm saying, because it applies to you. I don't do golf. I, I live at a golf course community and I don't golf. I back up to open space. Yeah. What can I tell you about that? They're going to happen anyway. Um, it was something I never really wanted to do. I've done some of it. I was involved with the original Sentara when it was Rocky Mountain Village and rebranded it to Sentara, the big development down there, big money development, um, which was a wonderful experience, sort of master planning, all that kind of stuff. Primary residential, you're talking about? Yeah. No, there's some things that kind of give me a little heartburn because everything's named after what it used to be Fox Run or. Um, you know what I mean? But people have to have places to live. So I don't have a great answer for that. It's kind of like getting involved with something. Are you a player or are you not? If you feel like you can affect change and do it better than the last one, then, then feel good about what you're doing, right? It's gonna happen. So it, it, and, and so it just wasn't something that was my passion. You know, so I didn't, I didn't go down that.
Thank you so much, everybody. I didn't know if Merlin wanted to say anything. He has his mic off. Did you want to say anything, Merlin? Are you still there? Uh, he's probably stepped away. I was just went way too long. Okay, you did. I tried Merlin online, and he said, "Thank you, and you were responsible." Yeah, he's the reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have some like refreshing stuff aside, some water, some bubbly water, and some. Can I leave now? This meeting, am I supposed to sign out? I think so. Okay, thank you so much, everybody.